This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, Justin Pruitt, and our brand new patron, Jay. Coming up on DTNS, stop saying autonomous cars are dead. They're just resting. Plus, did Meta Panic announce a new Quest VR headset? And Be Real enters the chat. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 1st, 2023 in Greenville, Illinois at the Smart Center. I'm Tom Merritt. From the loveliest Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Travellino. And from deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, California, am I right, Roger? Uh, I know, the temperatures are so mild and cool. West coasters, yeah. (laughs) You're not wrong. It's like really nice in in California right now, and it's super hot out here. All right. uh, Let's start with the quick hits. AMC Theaters makes money off tickets and concessions, but as folks started to go to theaters less, it started its own streaming video service. They called it AMC Theaters On Demand, wanted to fill a little of that revenue gap. Well, Fandango separate company, makes its money off selling tickets for theaters. But similarly, foreseeing a gap years ago, bought a video streaming service and then later bought Vudu and merged them together. So the consolidation continues. AMC Theaters On Demand is being replaced by Fandango's Vudu, which will still be owned by Fandango, but become the official streaming destination for AMC Theaters patrons. Users of AMC Theaters On Demand have until August 31st to transfer their movie collection over to Vudu. Well, back in April, Reddit announced it would start charging for API access. It had been offering free API requests before then. According to Christian Selig, the developer of the popular independent Reddit reading app, Apollo, Reddit plans to charge $12,000 per 50 million API requests. So based on Apollo's current usage, that would cost them about $1.7 million per month. By comparison, Twitter does charge $30,000 for the same number of requests. Under Reddit's new API pricing, it should be noted, bots and academic researchers are not charged. WordPress.com launched its newsletter offering back in December, uh, and now it's added monetization options, putting it fully on par with Substack, at least as far as monetization goes. Newsletters now support paid subscriptions and premium content. Users can use this that feature to send out just a newsletter or automatically send blog posts through the email. All newsletter features are available to any WordPress.com blog, even the free ones, but paid plans will have lower transaction fees on newsletter subscriptions, including 0% on the commerce tier. Security company Eclipsium says it's discovered that the firmware for up to 271 gigabyte motherboard models don't properly secure automatic firmware updates. This could let malware hijack the firmware's built-in update installer and effectively make it a backdoor. The update utility isn't malicious in itself, but Eclipsium says Gigabyte's firmware did not properly authenticate code or even consistently use encrypted HTTPS connections over regular old HTTP, making it vulnerable to man in the middle attacks. Eclipsium recommends disabling the App Center download and install option in the firmware, blocking as well as blocking the three sites, the uploader contacts, and implementing a BIOS level password. Uh, Eclipsium passes on to Gigabyte, and they are working on a fix. And Motorola officially announced its new Razer foldable phone, the Razer Plus. Launched on June 23rd for $999, a 3.6 inch 144 hertz OLED OLED screen on the front. So when it's closed, that's about twice the size of the one on the Galaxy. You can run full apps on that closed screen, has a usable keyboard. The entire foldable phone uses a Qualcomm 2022 flagship system on a chip, does not leave a gap when it's closed, and is IP52 water and dust repellent. There's also the standard Razer offering, which is a smaller 1.5 inch screen when closed that one will use a mid-range qualcomm soc no word on the pricing or release date for that yet all right let's talk about this new quest headset meta ceo mark zuckerberg posted on instagram today uh today being thursday that a quest 3 vr headset will come out this autumn a 128 gigabyte version will cost you 500 bucks There will be an option with more storage space. Didn't give any price on that one, though. Zuckerberg said the Quest 3 will be 40% lighter than the Quest 2, a run on a newer Snapdragon chip, which seems obvious. Uh, But he promised it'll have 
twice the performance graphics wise your old quest 2 games will also run on the quest 3 we got backwards compatibility and the quest 2 will remain available they'll just cut the price and uh, performance boost will come from a firmware update meta will share more details at the connect event and you say oh well they're announcing in june when's the connect event september September 27th. Uh, but if you want, you can sign up for more info at meta.com slash quest. A surprise announcement on Instagram just a few days before Apple's WWDC, where Apple is expected to announce their own mixed reality headset. Justin, what could it mean? That Meta lost the plot when it came to VR and mixed reality. This was the pivot that was supposed to redefine their company. And every move that they have made since then has not landed. They wanted to make these headsets a fleet product for businesses. Not a thing. They have not really advanced the line of the Quest as a mainstream gaming platform that it was certainly on the path for before they decided to make it the entire focus of their company. And let's not even get into the metaverse and how much that looks like an absolutely propped up system. The fact that they're rushing out a half an announcement to an announcement that will eventually be fulfilled toward the end of the summer is kind of desperate. Yeah. And it's interesting that this comes after they already gave a hands on to, uh, you know, Apple boo, Mark Gurman, uh, who, who, you know, very notably the, the biggest Apple reporter out there gets a hands on with the, uh, the meta quest three, I, I don't know, like a week ago and had pretty glowing reviews, you know, with the pass through video and stuff like that. And either, that didn't get the reaction that they wanted or, uh, you know, Meta got some some information on, uh, you know, pricing for what Apple is going to be announcing or something like that to feel like they had to come out and come out with something concrete and something uh, to, to fill up the news cycle ahead of WWDC. But, yeah, Justin, I mean, the, the fact that, you know, this kind of came along with their VR gaming showcase, right, that was happening today, too very much is feels like hey we're we're focusing this on a gaming uh, uh, device a nary a word of the metaverse uh, at least in this announcement they showed people gaming you know in the in the preview video on that uh, and that definitely was the focus Back in March, uh, the estimate was they'd sold 20 million quests all told probably the majority of those are quest twos I, I'd guess at least half probably more than half uh, I, I'll push back a little on the Quest Pro being not not fulfilling its purpose. I don't really know what the enterprise sales of it are and what kind of long-term service agreements they get. A lot of times we look at enterprise stuff and think it isn't succeeding because we don't hear a lot about it, but maybe that's doing fine. Nevertheless, it is reeking of desperation for Meta to come out the Thursday before a Monday announcement on Instagram to say $500, in case you were wondering. So does that mean, Justin, I mean, we get in the world realm of wild speculation, but does that mean that Meta figured out the price that Apple's going to sell its mixed reality headset? Or did they just say, you know, it's going to be a more than a $500. Let's get that price out there. One of the most long running uh, Justin Tom back and forth is the <laughs> idea that, that I believe failed consumer products say that they're pivoting to enterprise so they don't have to you know, report earnings and have any kind of footprint. And you seem to buy that. I seem to be skeptical. That being said, the plan for that headset was to be enterprise. And we have not seen a ton of them. And we've seen a lot of the reviews for them be lackluster. And I, I don't think that that is something that is conducive to getting the kind of sales that they want. As for the price anchoring, almost assuredly, there's, there's, they probably know what this is going to be priced at. One of the games that Apple has long played in the press, and this is going back decades, is they usually leak a price that is way higher than what they're going to actually put it out at. I remember early iPhone articles being like, well, it's going to it's going to be a two thousand dollar phone, yeah, which yeah, yeah. thousand dollars for a phone. No, it was going to be less than that. And so that was the, the, the plan that they had from the very beginning. This might be a weaponized opposite version of that let's anchor a price that is lower than what we know they're going to go at 
Yeah, and and I would be shocked if Apple's mixed reality set were five hundred dollars. That just that seems hard for them to do because e- even the believable leaks were that Apple was trying to figure out how to get the bill of sale down to and decide whether it should be a loss leader or not. I guess they could. They're Apple. They've got enough cash. They could decide to make it a super loss no. leader for a while. But I don't expect them to do that. Five hundred. Five hundred is Apple Watch money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they they would not. Meta would not like be this forward with basically just the price and okay, it's it's lighter and more comfortable. That was like the only other thing we didn't get specifics on a chip inside of there. We got some performance figures, but the the idea that they're leading with price, right? They want to the 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 first post about the Apple headset to be it costs four to six, you know, meta quests and stuff like that. So I I, I don't think that is a coincidence to yeah. me that signals that's I mean, that's obviously their play. Hey, it's cheaper than a PSVR two. It's it's going to be factors cheaper than, uh, mm-hmm. you know, an, an Apple headset. And we have this catalog of games that we built up with the Quest 2 that's highly successful. That great. Look, hey, look, they're going to look really awesome on this new headset. I, I, one, one, one final thing. You don't do this if you are secure with your place in the your yes. spot in the marketplace. No, this is, yeah. this is you don't need to your move. Yeah, this the, if any, if anyone out there doubt, is wondering about this, you don't go on Instagram with the CEO of a company to announce pretty much nothing but the price. They're like, "Oh, it's going to be lighter. What a shock! It'll use a different chip." No, you know, uh, yeah, that that's that's exactly right. All I will add is that if you are an enterprise user of the Quest Pro, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. <laughs> Love to hear your stories. And if you're not, please send one in too. We'll <laughs> okay, see who gets more. <laughs> All right. Well, the social imaging sharing site, Be Real, has been expanding its functionality. Its latest test is called Real Chat. They're, they're on brand with this naming convention, a chat feature available to users in Ireland right now. This lets users send messages, images, and reactions to friends in private whenever they want. You don't have to wait for the, you know, for the Be Real uh, usual two minute window of authenticity. You can just send messages to your heart's content. This is the latest new functionality added to the app to try and grow engagement. It added a real people feature of curated users last month, added the ability to show what you're listening to from Spotify or Apple Music when you're posting your authentic Be Real moments, and also rolled out bonus Be Real posts for users uh, that post when they're prompted. You get two extra ones to post. So, Justin, lots of new features from Be Real messaging, kind of a big feature. They said customers wanted it. Feel like part of a plan for Be Real or just throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks at this point? I think that it's actually just a smart move, no matter what. I'm not privy to the growth or stagnation of Be Real, but we do know that it is a class of app that came in for a post Snapchat generation of users, largely aided by the pandemic, where they were forced apart, that they could have some element of authenticity and put them in some version of something that's not as important as Instagram, but not as uh, work intensive as creating a Snapchat profile. That being said, If you want to ingratiate yourself within the social fabric of your user base, a chat system is mandatory. It is equally as smart to me as a a decision if you were everything was going great as it is if everything is not as great as you would like it to be. And you would indeed want there to be another reason to have people open your app. Yeah, I, we knew that Be Real's concept of like in the moment, real pictures was not going to be enough to continue to grow the audience. We always knew, okay, they're going to come up with something else. This isn't a bad one to say like, hey, those of you using this every day, here's a way to talk to each other more. That gets you to use the app more. It's something people like. They did it in Ireland. I guess they think they're chatty in Ireland. Um, <laughs> they launch all their tests in Ireland. I, yeah. I don't know what I mean, they're, what they're they, doing. Uh, uh, now we know the loads, uh, the, the server load for what's the crake being <laughs> What's the crack? Yeah. I, um, I, yeah. I, so so this, this all tracks. The second question I've had about Be Real Beyond Engagement has been, how are you going to make money off this? And we still see no clue on that because they're not going to start charging people for chat. So so it doesn't answer that, but it does say, okay, this is their first step towards trying to keep people on the app more. Chat opens up some monetization options. You could do the, you know, the classic sticker pack Stickers. that's fallen out of fashion, but yeah. you could build a, there are, there's easier to build in services in a way that don't feel obtrusive into chat than they would if they were in your main feed. In a lot of ways, I see them coming almost like trying to do a reverse Snapchat, right? Where like Snapchat takes off in a lot of ways because it is this, it, you know, it's this 
disappearing chat app that feels like you can just have one-off conversations. They don't follow mm -hmm. you. You don't have to worry about managing them. This kind of feels like, okay, we, we have like this, this visual aspect of it. Now let's graft on this chat. Hey, this is what the kids like. But it also like it also feels like a worse version of that because they don't disappear unless you both delete the messages. Like there, there's no word about, oh, are these encrypted? Like any kind of security? It just seems I, if if I'm looking for like a secure ephemeral chat, like that's the that's the draw. This is right? not. Post that, going, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I don't think they're trying to sell it that you way. Are, but, yeah, Rich, you are way overthinking this. Like yeah. but this is this is a standard feature for any kind of social media app in the modern era. Like, I you will. I will what, what, say what, Rich is right. If they wanted it to stand out, they would have launched with end-to-end -end encryption and put a privacy feature what, on it. That yeah, would but have... that's not their audience. Their audience does not care about that. What what I will say is I enjoy using Be Real, and I, I treat it like a little baby bird of a social network that I don't find annoying. And I feel it trying to fly away from me at this point with these, you know, each new feature is this baby bird growing up and it's, it's starting to get little talons and it's clawing up my hand and it's trying to it's trying to be its own thing. And I just want it to be this non-annoying thing. That's <laughs> are, very are, you, are you talking about your kids or Be Real? I've, I've got, <laughs> yeah. There are many metaphors that I'm mixing here. <laughs> However, I Be Real, please don't be annoying. I chat feels like uh, of all of their new features, honestly, this one feels like it has the most utility. I can comment on someone's thing. And yeah. It doesn't have to be public with all of their friends. Even if that is a very curated list, I do enjoy that. Like I, I enjoy that that feels very organic to how I want to use be real. That being said, I just like, if you're going to do this, we are, we are in a saturated messaging marketplace. I, I would like it to be a little bit more focused. If your whole thing is your ephemeral post, you're, you're be focused on that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're thinking about it the wrong way. The, the point <laughs> isn't that it differentiates, differentiates itself as the place to talk. It's that you can talk. Yeah. On this you app. don't have to and leave. Their, to their talk. goal yeah. is to yeah. just get you to open it more than the one time yeah. when they give and, you the two and, minute and window. The community that you create on Be Real is something for which you are able to interact with your friends there. If you created a community, you can now interact with them more. It does not have to differentiate itself in terms of the chat marketplace itself. That being said, Rich, I can only imagine how upset you were when the band you first saw in the club got a record deal uh, they, they sold out i can't believe it yeah no that tracks how dare they make a living well folks we're not on be real maybe we should be i don't know but we are other places on social media if you'd like to get in touch with the dtns folks here uh go to dtns show on twitter and mastodon that's dtns s-h-o-w mastodon server is mstdn.social if you need that and we're daily tech news show on tiktok and dtns picks dtns p-i-x on instagram <laughs> For a while now, self-driving cars, autonomous car predictions were kind of like free beer signs. It was always tomorrow. <laughs> we'll have them tomorrow, we swear. Uh, we'd hear predictions that by a given year, we'd have autonomous vehicles. 2016, we heard Ford and Lyft say it was going to happen in 2021. It didn't. Uh, since then, we've seen ride-hailing services shut down their autonomous divisions. Ford and Volkswagen shut down their Argo AI self-driving venture. And suddenly, self-driving tech seems a little bit further off. But mm -hmm. Timothy B. Lee of Ars Technica recently published a post arguing that this, quote, death of self-driving cars is greatly exaggerated. He points to the slow but significant development of Alphabet's Waymo and GM's cruise services, both of which now offer driverless commercial services. Both companies are still making rosy growth predictions, but Lee argues that these are now informed by real-world knowledge rather than assumptions of where driverless tech would be. So, have years of crying driverless wolf made us overly cautious to any self-driving promises, Tom? It's like podcasting, right? It's 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 going to replace everything. Oh, it's dead. Oh wait, it's going to replace everything. Oh, it's dead. Like I I see that cycle happening with autonomous cars. I always felt that it was overblown in its earliest days, and then a lot of folks in our audience were like, "It'll never happen." People were saying it's going to be 40 years, and I'm like, "Well, that seems a little too long." So, I have enjoyed following the progress, but the progress has slowed. 
over the last several years. And it does feel, and I think Timothy Beely is noting this very well in his Ars Technica piece, it is starting to accelerate again. Pardon the <laughs> metaphor. Uh, we, we are starting to see the expansion in Phoenix of Waymo's service. We, we see a good chance that crews might, in fact, be able to get 6,000 vehicles on the road by 2025. Like These are starting to feel like achievable goals now because of the progress we're seeing. It's slower than the mo- biggest ost- optimist we're saying at the be- beginning, but it's actually better than the biggest pessimists we're saying. The thing that stands out to me is this idea, like back in, in 2016, I feel like especially when you're talking about maybe the, the, the more tech platform company, you're talking about Uber and Lyft making these these grand proclamations about self-driving. It's like the, the realization that there's no Moore's law for for making an autonomous car, right? Like they they had they had they they saw the tech platform going forward, right? Like, hey, we can we can make our, our we can scan our LIDAR so much faster, we can process this much data so then we can get to this place. And one, there's not an agreement about like what technology even is is the best for these types of systems. And two, you know, to Lee's point here, having miles on the road really matters. And I think like Waymo has learned this very, yeah. uh, very astutely in, in their stuff of like, you need to have, there, there are so many variables and simulations and real world testing that you have to do that just doesn't scale because you have a faster processor or something like that. Like, yes, you have a system that can control the car that can scan however many meters ahead or something like that. But it, you, I mean, uh, man, I, I'm walking into puns right here. The rubber yeah, has yeah, to meet yeah. the road. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, okay. go for it. Just, just yeah, steer, yeah. Into, <laughs> steer into those puns. Rich. Yeah, steer into the skid. <laughs> The problem is that this is not simply an engineering challenge. Yeah. And everybody keeps looking at it like it's an engineering challenge mm-hmm. and that Moore's law is is what we need to do. But it's not. It's just as much winning hearts and minds of humans that are going to be staffing governments that have to decide whether or not driverless vehicles are on the road. And for every one person that gets injured, hurt, or God forbid, killed by a vehicle that does not have human hands at the wheel, regardless how illogical it might sound to those who just want to look at this like a spreadsheet, it will set this back not only in the monetary sense of the companies that are funding them but also as far as it can progress i do believe that a lot of this is media narrative yes there are engineering problems yes they might be solved by the ai revolution that we are seeing right now because that is a great pathway to solving a lot of problems that might be very very imperceptible to the human brain because you can throw that amount of computing power at it but the the idea that it was going gangbusters and then slowing down no. and now it might be growing again. I, I think that when we look back in history, it will look like a far more steady incline than than our perspective is on it, watching it from the 24 hour news cycle. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I tell you, it looks like a, a decent incline up until 2018. Uh, that that's when Waymo had bought 62,000 minivans and all that. And sadly, what happened in 2018 was an Uber autonomous car because of a failed safety driver struck and killed a person. And all of a sudden you see the progress slow because all of these companies focused on safety. Uh, and I, and I hate to put it like this, but this will happen again. We are seeing them pick up the pace now because they finally feel like we can move on from safety, not because we've cracked it, but because we've done all we can on safety and we need to move into a different kind of service to in order to progress. And they're going to do that. And there's going to be another incident and it's going to slow things back down again. That's but, that's just yeah, the way this has to work. An auto fatality will happen. Exactly. In what? five seconds, in five seconds by a human from now, statistically. Oh, an sure. Auto fatality will happen in America. And- uh, uh, the idea of bringing self-driving cars, which could be safer than human drivers, unfortunately, will likely still include an auto fatality at some point. Exactly. How, that, how the people process it and how it affects the business case going forward, that's the question. Yeah, and we, we've, we've seen one example of that. It yeah. slowed things down and refocused on safety. It's probably going to be something like that in the yes. future. And it it reminds me, Tom, a lot about your discussions about where we are with AI. We've we are at that plateau that, you know, we've we've gone through that giant advancement of like, oh, my gosh, we have autonomous, you know, uh, cruise control or, or, you know, all the all these different uh, driver assistance systems. We're at that plateau in part because unlike AI, these, to your point, have to interface with 
real world infrastructure that's been around for decades that, you know, is, is not that they are engineering around that. Uh, in a way that AI doesn't necessarily have to deal with. So I, I think that's an interesting parallel. Also, if you're a Tesla fan wondering why we're not talking about Tesla, uh, read Timothy B. Lee's piece. He has a great ending piece about the difference between what Tesla is doing and what Waymo and Cruise are doing. Uh, they're trying to achieve different things, uh, and yes. they're they're both doing them well, but they're just they're just aiming at different parts of the problem. All right. Well, Tom, Justin, do you like tennis? Yeah, ten I, I go for tennis. Tennis is cool. <laughs> Would you like tennis legend Roger Federer to be the voice of your directions in the Waze Navigation app? Now, that's a separate question. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> because if you speak French, English, or German, we have got good news for you. Roger Federer has become the first celebrity Waze voice to give directions in three languages. Uh, Justin, are you excited uh, to, uh, you know, to have some uh, Roger Federer in German telling you to make a left? No, but I want to <laughs> take this into a totally uh, separate direction. I love the fact that Google is spending money on Waze and they're still trying to keep Waze special. They understand that despite the fact that they have a competing service with Google Maps, that there is a there's room for Waze to exist. And I desperately wish that Apple had made the same decision. Oh, with the Dark boy. Sky there we go. Just let Dark Sky live. Or if you're going to eliminate Dark Sky, make your inferior weather app an absolute clone of it. Polish it up, put it in whatever font you want, and just give me the app <laughs> that I want. Stop it. Waze is, is, the, is the correct way to go with this for, for, for Google. Come on. Not everything is about Dark Sky. <laughs> Most things are when I'm bothered by it, and it's actually raining in Austin. Well, and and it is a great example of of Google. I I still wonder why Google has not merged Waze into Google Maps, and yet I'm very glad because because they're both they equal care. data fire hoses. They they can extract user data from both of these services equally. They don't need to merge them. Well, the, theoretically, they would extract the same amount of data, but I think you're right. I think there are there are people who would stop, would not use That's Google true. Maps if or, exactly. or, or vice versa. So, yeah. It just tells I, me that they don't help. hoover up as much data with the weather app. That's what that for, tells me. For Google, the, it also allows ways to be something where they can sell ads against it in a different way than they can Google Maps. They've kept Google Maps oh, as yeah. has been fairly ad-free in terms of like the, the front-facing element mm -hmm. of it. They don't care how much they make ways into a NASCAR. Yeah. And Apple uh, doesn't need to do uh, a better advertising delivery mechanism. That's, no, they don't just care about it. They just care about priority. ruining my favorite weather app. And there's they nothing don't want to collect data. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Justin. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Hopefully it's not about Dark Sky. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, we have this fantastic email from Eugene writing in after listening to the latest episode of Know a Little More. He said, just listen to Know a Little More about Taiwan. It was very well researched and a great primer on the topic. My grandfather was a general in the KMT. My oh, wow. father would tell me stories of the old days. My wife is also from Taiwan, and we go back to visit regularly. I've had a vague understanding of the political situation, but your podcast helped crystallize everything for me many Thanks. Uh, that is one of the highest compliments that we could get. Uh, and when I say we, I mean uh, me, Amos, and Justin Robert Young, uh, who worked on this episode as well, I'd know a little more, uh, to have somebody who has family stakes in the history that we are telling uh, tell us that it was not only told well, but helpful is uh, incredible. So thank you, Eugene, for, for writing in. If anybody else wants to check that show out, uh, go to knowalittlemore.com. All right, Justin Robert Young, uh, besides Know a Little More, uh, what else you got going on these days? Well, of course, yeah, Know a Little More, a fine dog and pony show production. And yet another one is there if you would like to get the political panel discussion that is sweeping the nation. We're not wrong. Myself, Jen Briney, and Andrew Heaton. This week on the program, we talk about the boycotts. Boycotts are going crazy these days as well as getting into some of the escalation in Russia with drones hitting mm. apartment buildings in Moscow. Go ahead and check it out. We're not wrong. Some of my favorite conversations every week are the folks on We're Not Wrong. I love how for patrons they have a, a special conversation that they do. Uh, separate from the rest of the show. I love it so much. We stole the idea. Patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. California has a bill to force platforms to pay news publishers, and Meta is already threatening to stop carrying news on Facebook, probably Instagram, in the state. Uh, it's just the latest in the parade of save journalism laws. So is this just how it goes? 
Or does journalism have another possible future? Justin Robert Young is going to save journalism, patrons. Stick around. And remember, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. To find out more, all the details are at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We shall return tomorrow talking about the popular revival of pinball with Ron Richards. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>